And we are live. Cool. Back on track in the new year with Enterprise Hits and Misses Radio. Oh, I just realized I forgot some of my preparation, but that's okay. I've got Bonnie Tinder here. That's all that matters. Returning champion from Raven Intel. You've been on my podcast before back in the day. Absolutely. How you doing? Yeah, I'm great. So glad to be here in 2021. And yeah, glad to have a conversation today. Yeah, so for, for our listeners, what you're in store for from Bonnie, uh, her her firm Raven Intel. Let me let me just say something real quick. I don't want to trash the entire enterprise analyst community, but I find enterprise analysts either really boring or really, I don't want to say corrupt, but like basically business models that really make me feel queasy inside. Um, a lot of non-disclosure or vendor activities and whatever. And I say that kind of perhaps hypocritically because Diginomica may be a media analyst hybrid to some extent. So maybe make make what you will of that but raven intel when you came onto the scene was always super fascinating to me because you guys are trying to do something different and this whole notion of provide providing in my view accountability and transparency into how enterprise consulting services and software are delivered is like so important and it's a monster topic and i and i also liked how you kind of honed in a little bit on hcm and cloud hcm to start with as a base because such a huge topic, how are you going to do it all? Anyway, I've been a fan for a while, so it's really good to have you on. Thanks so much. Absolutely. So, so glad to be here and, and to talk through, you know, what we're seeing in, in terms of enterprise and HCM project success, particularly mobile last year. Yeah, that's one of the, that's one of the recurring themes of my show so far is to, is to have some fun, like uh, poking fun at kind of, buzzwords uh we we did brian summer and i did a hr tech thing a while back where we we mocked a bunch of like overused buzzwords but at the same time um and we are going to do a countdown of your top hr project mistakes uh in a bit but we're also going to get into project success because i mean ultimately while success remains elusive sometimes on enterprise projects that's why we're all here is to try to improve the success ratio somehow and and get more out of this this all <laughs> these endeavors that we spend so much time on. Um, so so can you tell us just a little bit about in in general how Raven Intel gathers unique data that can like kind of help both your clients but also the market in general? How how do you do that? Yeah, absolutely. So Raven Intel is a is a peer review site. So if you think about like Yelp and and Glassdoor. Um, we are in a, a very similar model to that, but what we look at specifically is enterprise project success and the and the partners and uh, or SIs as we call them uh, that lead those those projects. And um, you know, essentially, the 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 purpose of the site is to help customers make the best decision a consulting partner. Um, you know, I was in the industry for the past 25 years and really felt like this was an area that customers had so much, so, so, so little awareness about. And um, we essentially get our information and, and these reviews from customers who have actually gone through a project. Um, you know, why I feel so passionate about this area is that I think that the voice of the customer speaks volumes. And up until now, it's been on mute for a whole bunch of years. And um, you know, as I mentioned before, you know, customers when they go to make a decision about a software, they have lots of resources. They can you know look at peer reviews about you know how how good is feature function and user experience and all those things. But nothing really existed uh, previously about the implementation effort. And in so many ways, the implementation makes or breaks the success of a, a, a software or a digital transformation. So um, essentially that we look at, at digital transformation projects uh, that have been, been done. And what informs us um, is the voice of the customer. It's these reviews that are completed by actual customers who tell us, you know, how was the project? Was it completed on time, on budget? We ask a, a whole bunch of different things, but that's really the, our research um, is, is what was the experience of customers? Right. And, and some of your information is, is, is proprietary to your clients, but then you also share stuff on your, on your Raven Intel blog as well. Right. So folks want to get a taste of that. They can get on over to that after the show as well. For sure. For sure. And okay. on our site, we have over a thousand 
uh, peer reviews about uh, you know 200 plus SIs. Those are all free available for anybody to read. And I greatly encourage you to go out to Raven and Tell and take a look. Cool. Yeah, you know, the, one of the reasons I really like this topic is that I, I, I get depressed sometimes because I feel like uh, customers, even with the best of intentions, they lock in with with a prime vendor that that they're comfortable with, and it be such a project to become a prime vendor and jump through the red tape. And it's kind of by default they wind up with these relationships, uh, or or it's a regional services partner that gets recommended or something. And I used to call them golf course relationships because I kind of made fun of the idea that so much of it felt like whining and dining rather yeah. than like oh, you really have the subject matter expertise and the industry experience. And I do think that's starting to change. But if customers are going to be brave enough to branch out and look at more specialized entities and 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 different kinds of relationships, they do need guide a guide to do that. And so that's one reason why I'm really excited about your endeavor is because you're, you can provide a resource for that that can help provide a sounding board for like, okay, well, what are these other firms like and what kind of reviews are they getting? So I really like that. Absolutely. And, you know, we aggregate all the information so you can look across, you know, Raven Intel, thus this idea of bird's eye view. You're able to look across, you know, multiple options. And in doing so, you know, you're going to get a better deal than if you just go with the guys that, you know, your software vendor walked in the door. Not that they're not good, but, you you know, you want to make sure it's your choice. It's going to be your implementation. You want to feel comfort in who you're choosing, that that person or that that, that person, that firm is the right fit for your project. Yeah, totally. So um, some of my audience members just want to remind you, this is an audience participation show. So uh, if you don't want to hear me prattling on for the next hour, you need to start posting some comments uh, and, uh, and, and feel free to air it out on some of your product experiences too. And we'll try to get to that as well. Also, Bonnie has some data she's going to be sharing with us shortly on what she's learned from 2020. Uh, transformation efforts. That's going to be cool. But before we get to that, Bonnie, I just want to ask you a little bit more about like just just uh, obviously the pandemic's been highly disruptive to how pretty much everyone in our industry did our jobs, right? Because, you know, I used to see you at this show and that show, right? And and that that was a that was a big part of how how we followed through on what we were doing. So so how did you adapt and how do you like make sure that you're still getting the good insights that fuel your business despite these circumstances. Yeah. And, and, you know, so much of our activities were anchored around customer shows where, where we could go out and, you know, have a focus group and talk to, you know, 20 customers at once. So it was really, you know, we had to think outside the box in terms of how do we, you know, get in front of, of customers to make sure that we're still, you know, really listening into that, that, that voice of the customer. Um, so, you know, it, it, it was it was challenging without these events, and it, it was challenging for the SIs. It was challenging for software vendors to also not have those abilities to to get in front of customers and establish relationships and things like that. Um, you know, I, I would say um, we have done so much in terms of video communication um, and also video capture actually of voice of customer um, this year as well. So we've done a lot of, you know, videos where we can get those out to, you know, multiple people. Um, and that's been, that's been a, a good, um, how should I say, uh, measure that I think we'll continue to use is, um, is this whole idea of video feedback and things like that, um, which has been great. You know, I think in terms of, of the, the project partners, the SIs or these consulting firms, they've really been challenged to be able to, you know, build relationships and, and get in front of customers and demonstrate, you know, why is it that they're better, a better choice than, than somebody else competitively? And I think one of the things that has really helped us is that, um, you know, SIs realize, I mean, Raven is a great way to amplify that voice and to be the sort of independent digital um, you know, resource that they can they can sort of showcase the, the good work they have for customers. So, you know, in some ways, it's it's caused um, you know, uh, particularly the SIs and the software vendors say, so how can we get our authentic message out using more digital formats? And I think Raven was um, you know was a, is, is a great resource to do that. Just want to give a quick shout out to the anonymous LinkedIn user. I know who you are, but you're still LinkedIn user for now. But happy New Year! 
uh, your show regular. I think you're going to enjoy this one based on what I know of your interests. Uh, we're going to talk HCM project mistakes and also project success. Um, Bonnie, just want to ask you before we get to your data. Uh, I know that when we hit the pandemic initially, a ton of projects got put on pause, uh, but but now a lot of projects have moved ahead. And obviously, the obvious ones were remote work and you know and things that had to do with in, in the HR side. Obviously, things that had to do with processing payroll and stuff, you know, timesheets, all that stuff has to go on. But what what in general have you been seeing? Have you seen kind of uh, s- some some bigger projects, you know, start to ramp up again, like on the HR side? What are you seeing in that particular area? Yeah, I, I think the biggest shift last year was we saw a higher volume of like phase two projects or optimization projects. So from years past, that was up about 25%. So customers saying, hey, look, I need to take what I have and add functionality to it to deploy um, you know, a, a, a COVID, um, you know, a resource center, something like that, um, or more work from home type of um, interactivity with employees. So that, 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 that optimization work, we saw an increase of 25%. I think we saw, you know, the biggest hit to the phase zero or one full suite implementations um, from previous years, that was down 10%. And, um, and yeah, we did see an increase in particular industries. So in the areas of healthcare and manufacturing, both of those had a 15% increase from previous years and in government to a little bit, a 4% increase from previous years in terms of um, you know, acceleration actually in, in the digital transformation space. So um, you know, I think overall there was just a, a little bit of a difference in, in type of work that was being done. Um, you know, across the board, though, 48% of our projects, 48% had a scope change. So that's close to half of them while in flight, either had to accelerate it and do do more or, um, you know, in, in a lot of cases, it was this is on pause until we can get more resources that are you know either furloughed at the moment or, you know, on leave something like that. So 48% had a scope change. Yeah. All right. Well, we have our we have our first comment. This is an interesting one. Uh, it's so hard now to compare a startup HR company to a well-established huge organization. It's already spent money on success factors, et cetera. I've seen huge improvements in larger organizations slowly pulling their day together to allow for really useful headcount finance cost supporting that previously was a nightmare to try to pull together. Any thought on that, Bonnie? Um. Yeah, reporting and analytics and this ability to to cull multiple sources of data, I would say that there's been huge strides in that. Yeah, whether you're a small company or a big company that uses uh, you know an enter- one, of, one of the enterprise um, level products. Yeah, I, I think um, we'll get we'll get to this a little bit later on, but I think there's also going to be huge pressure on, pressure on HR teams to figure out the state of platform issue just because like so much of returning to work in the next couple of years is going to be about managing effectively a lot of very sensitive data around employee health and, you know, whether it's vaccination or testing or, you know, who, who knows what, like it's going to be an interesting challenge for companies that haven't started pushing in that direction yet. Mm-hmm. So we'll mm-hmm. get into that. Without, without so, that. Uh, so uh, I want to just continue before we get into our little countdown here of, of your top HR product mistakes. I want to continue with a little bit more. You sent me some very interesting little data points. Uh, you shared some of them. Actually, before we get to that, I did want to ask you briefly about manufacturing as yeah. a sector. That one surprised me a little bit. Um, healthcare and governance, uh, governance kind of made sense. Obviously, manufacturing is a big sector um, and some areas of manufacturing did pretty well, but other, other sectors really got hit, especially those that had complex supply chains. Uh, I was a little surprised that that was a, a big bump there in the projects in manufacturing. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I Can mean, you get uh, any, in, insight into, in, any insight into why that was? You know, I, 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 I think that they probably are, were primed for that, that optimization space. So I don't know that they necessarily got it. You know, we're doing full blown. Um, 
but I think just in general, their optimization projects had increased, um, you know, from previous years. Yeah, we have a question about has any software company created functionality for the furlough concepts? That's just from my perspective in the UK. What about EU, USA? I, I don't know. I don't know the answer to that. Bonnie might. I, I don't either. Um, it's, it's an interesting one. Um, you know, beyond what the traditional HCM core functionality uh, would be, um, you know, it'd be interesting to know, um, you know, what specifically with furlough in terms of tracking. Yeah. And, and I think like this, this kind of brings up Bonnie, something that we can maybe talk about a little bit more later, but I, in general, I, one of my biggest criticisms of HR software vendors in general is the lack of fluidity in managing the workforce, right? Because, you know, more and more we have this fluidity between perm hires, temp hires, uh, gig economy platforms for sourcing talent, uh, you know, in the case of furloughs, right? Or project-based work, like historically all of that was handled either separately or not at all. And, uh, and, and I think we need a much more fluid type of software. Um, and, and then, uh, then how it excellent. Den, welcome to the show. Den hey, says Dad. he thinks work days on this. Den Bonnie says, hi. Yeah. Yeah. Work day is definitely one that I've in, in one of the briefings I went to, I, I heard some stuff along those lines. So, Dan, feel free to share more thoughts on this in the chat. Mm -hmm. So, Bonnie, what else from your research from last year on transformation projects? What else jumped out? Yeah, so I'll talk about a, a couple of things that I think surprised me. Um, I mean, despite all of the, the challenges last year, um, our what we saw in terms of overall delivery – so we look at on-time delivery and on-budget delivery. Those are two big KPIs. Both of those were actually up over previous years. Uh, so in on-time delivery, it was up 10%. And on-budget delivery, it was up 8%. So you know, to me, that could be likely a reflective of the fact there's more incremental project work going on versus these you know, full-blown implementations. Um, you know, it's nothing that you know we, we need to brag too much about because the, the rate is still about 60 40. So only 60% of the projects come in on time uh, versus 40 or, or late and over budget. So I mean we're making incremental project process progress there. And obviously we you know, all like to see that number up, um, but it is up over previous years. Um, the other thing is the satisfaction was up as well by close to a point. So we look at we ask three different things about uh, satisfaction. So we asked the customer, how, how satisfied were you with the project itself? How satisfied were you with the consulting firm or SI that led you through the project? And how satisfied were you with the, the software vendor themselves? And all three of those areas actually increased by a full point out of 10. Um, and so we saw project satisfaction higher as well. So it hovers around the eights out of 10 previous years were, you know, more in like the sevens. And um, so I think this is sort of a testament to so many of the vendors, so many of the, the SIs really, um, you know, bending over backwards in terms of trying to, to make it work for customers. And, you know, despite changes and, and, you know, personnel layoffs and furloughs and, and all of that to make it work despite some of those things. So, yeah, you know, all of that's good news. I want to catch up on a few uh, comments on the thread. Uh, Link teaser talks about across a company with thousands of employees. Some of them are perm. Some have gone part-time. Some are furloughed while the government pay 80% of the salary. I mean, the way I look at that uh, is, is that the pandemic, again, has accelerated the problem that already existed. We already had a flexible and fluid workforce that was beyond the scope of what most HR vendors can handle. It's just accelerated. Den says to verify the workday stuff, he'd have to go back to the analyst portal. I'm going to tell you not to do that, dude. It's um, it's about 9.30 p.m. Friday night, your time. You should not be logging into an analyst portal right now. So we're going to have to live without that data. Uh, Den says, um, we saw Oracle customers reporting surprising on-time levels, and those I spoke with were super happy. Um, yeah, that's that's uh, that's good to, good to hear. Um, mm -hmm. and, and maybe... 
maybe you know that experience with more incremental projects is is also maybe it's a little easier too i would guess to to hit success marks on those versus the more deeper transformational initiatives that got put on hold so i guess we should be a little bit careful maybe along those lines um one thing i did want to mention um that you sent me um which struck me quite a bit was you sent me these quotes on recurring themes on satisfied projects. Tell me about those. Yeah. Um, so we asked customers uh, lessons learned, right? What, what were the strengths of your partner? What lessons, you know, did you learn along the way? Um, the recurring theme that I heard about satisfied projects was number one, our vendor or SI was flexible with our changing needs. Um, Number two, they had a strong understanding of our broader challenges um, and a willingness to adapt to our changes. And I saw so many projects where during the course of the project, the, the project leader was actually laid off and the project continued. So at the customer site, the project leader um, you know, was, was laid off or they have multiple groups of employees that were laid off midstream. Um, one of the project reviews I just read was with an online sports betting company that continued on with their project despite their entire business being shut down for you know the first like six months of the year practically. And so it was all of these sort of things that caused uh, a need to be flexible and adaptable to you know what's the scope of this project going to be, you know, or how is that needing to change based upon all of these these business headwinds. And, you know, how adaptable was the SI and the software vendor to work with a customer through all of those sort of challenges? And I think when you have a, a, a project that's reviewed well, it was the customer absolutely recognized the fact that, you know, the, the, the vendor and the SI, um, you know, were, were extremely adaptable through those changes. Uh, and then says it's late here uh, and dinner's almost ready. Check his tweets for picks. So that's uh, D.A. Hallett if you want to see what Den's eating tonight. Uh, Den, I wish I was there, man, because I'm sure you're going to have a better dinner than whatever I scrounge up later tonight. Uh, well, but, but thanks for thanks for dropping in. We'll, pr we'll probably be off air by the time you're, you're done, but if not, uh, feel free to come back. Um, also, Den also answered briefly the question on the furlough schemes. Um, saying that in the UK that was handled via payroll and vendors moved on that quickly. Um, however, I would I would go back to my stump speech that I don't think in general uh, fluid workforces are being managed very well in, in HR software. Uh, now we have our another comment saying, uh, what's the next HR mistake not to make? And are these relevant more because of the new world COVID order? We're going to get to that. So uh, just hang in there. Uh, we're just about to pop in on some of those comments and uh, I have a few of my own as well. So um, anyway, uh, Bonnie, let's, uh, let's, let's start working through some of these top um, pitfalls that you're foreseeing uh, for 2020. G give me uh, give me one. We have five from you. So what, what's yeah. your top pitfall? Number five. Yeah. External integrations or integrations just in general. So comes up as the thorn in the side of every implementation and this idea of, you know, you have a fully integrated system, that sounds great. There is never a situation though that you have one system that just stands alone. And um, so I think in general, customers underestimate the effort um, of integrations or perhaps um, oversold about the ease of, oh, just connect those systems right together, standard integrations, all that sounds really good, um, but you really need to, you know, the devil's in the detail on a lot of those. And, you know, one of the common comments that I heard, um, I, I just wrote down one, lining up a technical resource on the vendor side and keeping up momentum with the integration development was challenging. It also generated unexpected vendor costs. And I have like a hundred that are just like this. So, it's number one is do not underestimate the integration factor and almost double the budget for your time and the cost as, as you look at that area. Yep. <laughs> A familiar story. <laughs> Den says, duh, duh. Yeah. yeah it per perhaps, it, perhaps it's a little bit of an obvious one, but it certainly has to be said because uh, unfortunately um, we don't pay enough attention to it. And, and one, one issue I really have with that too, is that 
in the cloud era, I think we're getting way too much of like, oh, we have a thousand APIs, so you're not going to have any problems. Mm -hmm. And and we just have to call, we have to call a collective bullshit on that. Yeah. And, 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 and that's not to make light of the fact that APIs are way better than the point to point integrations of on-premise in years past, but we still have to call BS on it. And Dan has a comment. I guess dinner's not quite quite ready over at Shea Halleck. A few more comments for Dan. They talk a good game, but are very thin on specificity. Yeah. So indeed. Yeah. Hey, along those lines, along those lines, Bonnie. Um, in terms of integrations, what are some of the most common that you're that you run into? I assume that that integrating with financial systems is big. Is there also things like H HR to HR, like payroll to talent? Like what are the top integrations you run into? Yeah, um, payroll uh, is a number one uh, sticky wicket there. Um, so so I hear payroll come up all the time. Financial is definitely so the the GL and you know all those aspects of financials. If you can believe it, and I know you can believe it, I actually get comments from customers that, that would say, and it's the same product, right? It's the same company that said the company had difficulty integrating their own product set to one another. So you really wanna make sure as you're doing your, your vendor selection that you know it can be one company um, in logo, but you wanna make sure that the product is truly all put together. Cause I will tell you on these reviews, I've gotten several that said, oh, our XYZ, you know, BizX didn't integrate to this piece of things or, or whatever. I, you know, I don't want to go into the, de the details there, but there, there's a lot of things that uh, people assume are integrated because it's the same company, but don't really talk to each other as you think they would. Yeah, Dan, Dan continues along. He says, we ask this question every time. We get diddly squat on detail beyond the usual suspects. Agreed. I mean, uh, integration is always in the in the details along those lines. He's curious. He thinks ADP has done a has essentially crushed this area. He says, I assume he's referring to payroll integration. Hmm. Yeah. I'm not I'm not gonna comment on that further, but but Den, Den's big on ADP for that. So yeah, yeah. I, I haven't I haven't heard them called out by name yet, but but what yet to be seen. That's good to know that the, that somebody has that going on. We'll watch for it. All right, cool. Uh, I'm gonna throw in a few as well, but not just yet. G give me your number four. Number um, four pitfall. Yep. Yeah, so not doing enough user acceptance testing uh, slash you know change management. So. Uh, one of the very indicative comments there, needed the most work and got the least attention due to time constraints. What I would say there is things look great on paper and fall apart when they get into the user's hands or when you actually start um, you know, user testing it. And this is one of the areas that gets shortchanged, particularly with these accelerated projects that happened last year. This user acceptance testing was one of those areas. And, um, so anyways, yeah, that, that one is one you don't want to scrimp on either. And change management, of course. Yeah, I was just like, when you said that, I was like, oh my God, we still have to talk about change management. But um, but we do. <laughs> yeah, it, it it seems like a continued underinvestment in change management and training, mm -hmm. despite the fact that, despite the fact that it's linked to just about every project success or failure. Yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. And, and I'll tell you, my number three is a little bit, um, you know, I would say re related to that in some way. So this idea of garbage in, garbage out. Um, again, this is Captain Obvious here, but the data cleanup that's not done before you bring your, you know, start with a new system. Um, you know, customers are like, oh, we'll just move, we'll, we'll clean it up once we get it in the new system. Guess what? That doesn't happen. And then all of a sudden now your new system's crappy. So, you know, the time that you can spend getting your house in order before you start on the project is time well spent. And this idea that, you know, we didn't do enough uh, data cleanup uh, and brought, you know, a whole bunch of crap into this new system became really problematic with some of the negative reviews that I saw. Yeah, we just had a comment on that too. And, and Den says, uh, 
that this is change management. UAT is his number one geeks versus suits issue. So uh, yeah. we have a comment here. We're eventually going to get senior management who understand data coding web apps, and then things will work properly at the moment. No one seems to have a clue apart from going on a training course or something. So, yep, the, the data gap at senior management level is something you just called out. And now we have Thomas uh, from CRM Convo. I was actually just on their show. Uh, so Thomas, always good to get the CRM perspective here. Uh, UAT is a challenge across the board, uh, yeah. not only in HCM. So indeed. Yeah. Um, and, uh, I like this snarky comment. We test in production. And unfortunately, <laughs> we still, we still, we still no, see no, wait, no, wait. Nothing like working with that in that. Yeah, exactly. So I'm going to actually give you one. I, I had a, a bunch of different ones. Um, I, I have a few like that I've kind of already mentioned. Um, but um, the the one thing I wanted to say was intrusive employee spyware without transparency. So like, I think we're entering an era where, where especially with the amount of remote work that accumulating digital data on employees is going to be a pretty big deal. And, and I already mentioned the return to work. And I just think that companies are going to have a choice to make on how, whether they're going to be an intrusive spy espionage organizations or whether they're going to be empowerment organizations. And I don't think there's going to be a whole lot of middle ground. I think they're going to really have to make a choice. And, if, and, you know, I think it's going to define, like their their success in some ways in hiring people going forward because you, you just get so many creepy feelings these days reading about companies and how they're monitoring people and you just think about oh you know you're going to require me to test every day and get my temperature every day and stuff like that that's a whole new level of trust um, in your employer and and I better I better be very very um, you know trustful of what you're going to do with that data if I'm going to do that you know so and how long are you keeping a history on me? You know, you get to keep that after I leave the company. I mean, yeah, a lot of, a lot of interesting questions as a result. Yeah, actually, Den's Den's curious if we can ever get to the bottom of these, these uh, change management and yeah. user acceptance. Uh, what is what is the root cause? I mean, we were kind of getting into that a little bit, but any thoughts on what the root cause of all of this is? Mm -hmm. You know, and and none of these top five project mistakes that I that I came up with are ch have changed from years past. They're the exact same thing. There's nothing that the pandemic did that, is, I mean, certainly the pandemic made things more challenging, but yes, these, have, these were the problems last year. They were the problems in 2018 and for 10 years prior to that. Um, I think how, how, where the inflection point, where things are gonna change will be is number one, better education in terms of what does an, an implementation entail? And having customers who are, are better educated on what they need to prepare for ahead of time, some of these pitfalls along the way. I mean, that's that's an obvious one. I think, you know, as things like project management software is enhanced and there's AI and there's ways to more scientifically potentially manage these things consistently, I think that that can that can be a way for a customer to have like a you know, implementation template that makes sure that, you know, all of these things are covered and mapped out well ahead of time. Um, you know, so I guess getting more scientific in the process um, and using some, you know, again, AI and, and intelligent sort of uh, tools to monitor, monitor project management, I think that could be really interesting for the future of implementation. Because now we know what the issues are, you know, and yet they continue to happen. How can we systematize those type of things? Not that every implementation is going to look alike, but how can we productize a great implementation process and help that now scale for, for on, the, on the customer side? I think there's some interesting technology um, applications that can happen there. Yeah, I have a I have a skeptical take on this and an optimistic take. My skeptical take is that all the things you're citing so far, I don't want to say they're mundane, but they have a certain detail-oriented practicality that I think requires a lot of discipline bearing down on. And mm -hmm. I think a lot of customers are are so caught up in like the sexy cloud technology solving their problems that I think they lose track of the mundanities that have to be dealt with 
that are just as important. And 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 to your point, I, I like the idea of AI playing a role as long as it's not sold as a cure all. So that's my more skeptical view. My more yeah. optimistic view is is customers assuming more responsibility for their own implementations, which ties in, I think, directly to what you're trying to do with your site. In the past, there's been way too much faith placed on the prime vendor to deliver a successful project without paying attention to what really your your employees that are embedded in your company and have given so many years to of service to your company are going to need to do to change their jobs to make this work. And and in my mind, part of what you're doing that could actually make a change here is to really encourage customers to take a more critical view on how they select their SIs and, and select the firm that really understands their industry and what the pitfalls are and what the benchmarks are and what the what 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 where 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 the issues are in their industry. And I think that's the kind of partnership in my view that leads to better projects. And so that would be my optimistic view is mm-hmm. that you firms like you can spark some change there. Absolutely. Anyway. Absolutely. And this this idea of improving the implementation experience, let's face it, everybody hates it. It's, a, the, it's, it's hard. It takes many years. And by the time that you've gone through a, part, or a, a vendor selection process, I mean, many times it takes a year for a project to get approved. By that point, you're like so tired that now I got to implement this thing. And so, you know, improving that process to me could be such a boon for for software and digital transformation, and it's it's wildly needed. And I think you know the basic elements are there. It's just how do we put that all together and make it now repeatable? Yep. Well, that was your unsolicited plug there, Bonnie. So there you go. Yep. Yep. Uh, yep. Uh, this is a little more of a visionary concept of creating a universal benefit management system that rewards everyone with enough to live then provides credits when you do work. That's a little beyond the scope of this, of this discussion today. I'm sorry, dude. Um, but, but yeah, I mean, th- those are the kinds of conversations that I think some people are having about where automation might eventually take us. But I think that's a little futuristic for now. And, and via blockchain, I'm just going to ignore your blockchain comment. We're not going to talk about blockchain today. Sorry. Uh, well, we're going to wait till we have some more proof points before we talk about blockchain as solving enterprise problems. Sorry about that, but that's just a that's one of the rules of the show. There's a handful of rules of the show. One of the show rules show rules is you can't talk about blockchain on the show because the show is or, about. Or if you do, you have to wait till the overhyped section to talk. Yeah, about. or or you, or you may get you may get teased a little bit. Yeah. You may be wondering what the other what the other rules of the show are. I'm not going to tell all of them to you now. But I can tell you, uh, call BS on buzzwords is one of the rules. No one's allowed to use the word pivot or call each other a thought leader. Um, and it's not a passive show. If you post a comment, we're actually going to respond, which I think everyone in the chat has has learned. So um, anyhow, uh, we, we proceed. Are we on number two on your list, Bonnie? Or one? I can't remember. Um, so external integrations, user acceptance, testing, can't be us, underestimated, garbage in, garbage out. We did those three Number four okay. um, is team changes and knowledge transfer. And this, this was a big one last year. So if you lay off your project manager or team members during the project or someone got sick, the knowledge transfer is going to be painful. And so I think last year there was there was a whole lot of, um, of just people change. And um, and and the, le- the more that you can do to, to reduce that and reduce the knowledge transfer that needs to happen, the better. If it happens on your SI side and they're constantly changing team members in and out, um, that's really bad. And that's one of those things that we measure out on our site uh, because you as a, a customer need to know what's the frequency that my SI is typically t- changing out team members because that's a huge risk factor for a project. Um, so my number four is, is uh, you know, the pitfall is when you have team changes um, and you have to do lots of knowledge transfers uh, in flight, that that's really problematic. So keep that to a minimum if you can. We got a couple of good ones on. We got a couple of good ones on my no pivot rule. Um, Dennis says he's moved on from pivots to pirouettes. I really like that. Yeah. If you, if, if you can pirouette in the friggin' pandemic, then, then you're, your business is, is looking really good. Um, and then, and then Bonnie, I think you recognize this familiar face. I sure do. Josh, hey, Josh. He's been doing the shimmy lately. <laughs> it, he says it works better than pivoting and it's easier than pirouettes. 
So, I, oh my God. I, th I think there's a, a TikTok uh, dance that we need to see here. <laughs> yeah. Pirouette. Yeah. Josh, feel free to uh, send us a video of what a of what a shimmy <laughs> what a shimmy looks like because we, we'd all we'd all love to see that. That's right, and then we want to see your pirouette too. Yeah, absolutely, Dan. We'll we'll see that pirouette, man. Absolutely. <laughs> yes, running targets indeed. Um, okay, all right. So um, stepping back from that, I guess we can do. We still have a ways to go because we haven't even gotten to your um top four tips for successful projects. So let's do your number one okay. of, of biggest, biggest pitfalls of HR projects in 2020. Uh, so, Oh, you mean my, my, my oh, number one or, or number. Yeah. Five yeah. Five. Yeah. Your, your biggest, your biggest pitfall, your yes. last one. That's right. So go live and checking the box at go live is different than living in the system. Go live is the tip of the, the iceberg you are not going to spot the errors right away. Um, and you'll have a celebratory cake and everybody will take pictures and then scatter and go off to their next project. Um, you do not want that to happen because you want to be able to live in the system um, for many months, many cycles to understand, you know, what, what happened or what's going to happen when we go through an open enrollment or, um, you know, performance review process or cycle or something like that. So don't never think of your go live as, um, you know, now, now we're on to, to something else. Look at that as the beginning of now the next phase, which, um, you know, which you want to make sure that you're watching and, um, you know, setting yourself up for success are those early days. All right, Den's off the dinner. Den, you neglected to actually mention what what you made for dinner tonight. So if you're still listening, just tell us what's on the menu, and then then you can have a proper sign off. Thanks for that. Oh, and good news, Josh is working on the video. His son's on oh. TikTok working at it right now. So soon we'll see the the Josh Greenbaum analyst shimmy. Love it, love it. Um, I, so I'm going to do my top um, HR project mistake, which could actually be a show unto itself, uh, which is um, which is um, too much trust in, in HR algorithms, um, especially when it comes to screening applicants, basically automating the wrong things. Um, and like, you know, you talked about using AI in a positive way, but there's also so much danger of using AI in exclusionary ways. And oh my God, in enterprise, it's a misses this year. I've documented all kinds of disastrous stories. If you go on Diginomica back, even back in 250, 2015, Brian Summer wrote a really good article on called You're Not Our Kind of People, if you do a search for that, on why analytics and HR are failing good people. And just this week, uh, a, an updated story uh, uh, on Wired, um, job screening service halts facial analysis of applicants. So now the, the ante is getting raised with, with facial interpretations. And some of this stuff is pretty scary because – this particular software from HireVue is live in a lot of companies right now. And um, there's, I just want to read this one quote from this piece on that, if I can find it. Um, let me just give me one quick second. I'll track it down. Um, there are parts that machine learning can probably help with, but fully automated interviews where you're making inferences about job performance, that's terrible. Uh, modern artificial intelligence can't make those inferences. I, I totally agree with that. And so I, I guess I just hope that that HR project managers really look hard at the role that algorithms play and the need for transparency and algorithm audits and things like that to make sure because properly used, I think they can be an asset. But I think to me, that's, I, if I had to pick one uh, a danger for HR, it would be that. And then the other one I already mentioned, which is the the danger of potentially not taking the right side in the issue of data when, when employee data is going to be such a sensitive, important issue. So those are my big ones. Yeah. Yeah. Any comments on that? Um, I, yeah, I, I would agree. I think that, you know, this whole idea of, of AI and, you know, personalization and, and all of that, um, you know, we, we really need to look at that with a, um, a careful lens in, in terms of, um, you know, sort of the Pandora's box that has potential to open. 
Neil Raiden. Neil, uh, by the way, if if you're interested in the ethics of AI, you should be reading Neil's stuff. It happens to be a lot of it on Diginomica. He also has his own site. Um, but uh, but anyway, uh, he's talking about a dream that he had about these transformation projects bypassing finance, who seem to pay for it. Um, he seems to come in and uh, help finance see if they're uh, getting anything out of this. Um, I think that actually is relevant, Neil. I mean, if you look, I, th I think we're talking about HR projects specifically, but a lot of Bonnie's lessons carry over into other areas. We just decided to focus on HR because that's at the core of what she's worked on. And and I've done some other focus shows. I thought it'd be good to do an HR show. Um, but uh, at the same time, the future of HR and finance are very closely linked. I think Bonnie would agree with that. And yeah. And the forward-thinking vendors, the flow with the forward-thinking vendors are integrating HR and FI workflows. So, in the future, there may not be the same distinction between HR and finance applications there are today. Yeah, yeah. So, cool. All right, we're getting a we're getting a good uh, good crowd here. Thomas, who by the way, Thomas made a guest appearance on the last video show of the year. So, if you want to check the replays on my YouTube channel, you can. Uh, Check check Thomas as he crashed the uh, project enterprise project mistakes discussion we we're having. They let the AI make these AI make inferences already before any interview, which is even worse. Absolutely, that's the whole point: is you're screening people out. Um, and and I, I just believe that in general you're going to exclude some incredibly qualified people. And not only that, but like one of the to me one of the big good news stories about the future of remote work and the companies that embrace it is the chance to be more inclusive of people who are historically excluded from the workforce that are incredibly talented, whether it's a working mother, uh, uh, someone who's paralyzed and can't make commutes. I mean, there's all kinds of incredibly talented people that, and, and my belief is that these algorithms are going to exclude a lot of these people unless they're, they're dealt with properly. So anyhow, um, yeah. And yeah, HR and finance. Yeah. We're not going to reconcile HR and finance today on, on our discussion. That's not the goal. Yeah. That could, so, be a whole, that could be a whole session on itself. Yeah, and, and and Neil says hiring and algorithms at this point are fraud. And basically my view on that is is that the the problem with AI that we're running into again and again is just overreach. It's not that the technology can't do anything for us. It's just vendors are overreaching. And, and unfortunately, and this is something Neil has pointed out to me in our email correspondence, is that a lot of these systems are in production these problematic systems. So that's the thing that's a little bit scary is we're not talking hypothetically here. A lot of these types of screening systems, for example, in HR are in use right now. I'll have to get Brian Summer and Neil back on the show to talk more about that and they can scream into the microphone a little bit and see if someone will wake up. Um, but we're not going to do that tonight because I want to go through your top four keys to HR project success you prepared for us. Give us your, yep. your number four for that. So my number four is uh, back to the area of integrations. They're more important than you think, take longer and can be problematic. I think to Den's point uh, before, I know Josh Greenbaum also um, who's, who's listening and would echo this, the less spaghetti, the less mess. So you wanna you know, minimize the number of integrations if you can um, around your project. Mm -hmm but the devil is in the details and you want to make sure that you're getting a click below, um, you know, the proposal and, and you know, sort of shiny sales packaging and really understand the effort required to hooking systems together by directional interfaces, what fields are, con you know, in, in the scope of work, et cetera, before you just sort of put that on the checklist. So that's my number four. Yep. That's a good one. And we, we touched on integration earlier in the broadcast. So if, yeah. if you yeah. folks missed that, catch it on replay. I think there was some good discussion there earlier with some of Bonnie's data from last year. Okay, yeah. let's let's move on to your number three. My number three is control what you can control. And um, you know, before your project gets approved, start getting your house in order. Clean up the bad data that you have. Um, you know, it's the time to rethink your process. So don't just, you know, take, um, you know, your spaghetti and, and move it into a, the cloud. I mean, obviously, it's a good time um, to reinvent all of those things or rethink all of those things before you start throwing technology at the equation. Um, I would say part and parcel to this in terms of control what you can control. 
so many project leaders last year and team members had things that got thrown out at them that they could not control. So the pandemic, new work from home situations, um, you know, personnel changes, all that sort of thing. Um, and, you know, if you have a way to systematically manage your project throughout the process, so, you know, there are project management softwares out there, I can certainly recommend um, you know, some that help you to make sure that your wheels stay on the bus and that you can control what you can control, um, you know, before your project even begins. Absolutely. Um, and I, I'll, I'll, I'll just add my number three to the list, which I've discussed a little bit already, but it's basically that there's no, don't, there's no such thing as an operational HR software project anymore. If you're doing it right. You should be thinking about data, your HR data platform and your HR analytics and basically how you're going to handle your HR data in order to either raise your employees up and be transparent about how you're using their data to make them safe or mm -hmm. how you're going to screw your employees over by 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 spying on them and being jerks. <laughs> so make your choice. Um, that's my number, th my number three. Okay, what's your number two? Your team is going to make and break or break your success. You want to pick the absolute best partner that you uh, can can get your A player um, team. So you want the A team working on the project. You want a solid project leader and you need an executive sponsor that is, is solid and working for you as well. If you don't have your team in place, you're fighting an uphill battle. The, the success of these projects depends on the people that you have working on the team and, and you want the A team. Do not do it with the B team because you know all the great technology in the world is not going to go if you don't have the right team making sure that it's it's implemented properly. I totally I totally agree with that. I want to I want to dig into it just a little bit um, on the A team part. Are, are there some specific challenges there that can be overcome? Because I think like obviously your A team people tend to have a lot on their plate. Um, how is it that you actually get them to buy into the fact that they should participate on this project and maybe put aside? Uh, other stuff they're doing? Like, how, how do you make that work? Yeah, it's a great question. Because the A-team, they're the least likely to have the time to devote to managing a project like this. Um, I, I think that it, um, I, I think how, getting them excited around what the outcome is going to be and the drivers in terms of the business outcome is the way to you know to make sure that you have your best people wanting to work on that is because they're going to see the impacts or you know know what what is the after picture going to look like and be the one you know as part and parcel to to making that change happen within the business i think that's that's a way to um you know to tie the initiative back to business impacts i mean that i don't want to steal my thunder on number one but I, I think the uh -oh. <laughs> I know, but I'm going to do it. I don't. I don't care. You have the the with the digital transformation. It's you know it's useless unless there's actually a transformation that happens, a business transformation. And you know you have to know your why and why you're doing the project. In fact, I even even wrote it on my blackboard. Oh yeah. Yes, yeah. yeah, because it's it's that important. It is that important. If you don't know what that why is in terms of uh, you know a software rollout, so what is the defined business goal, impact to the business, and objective? If, if those things are not defined, don't do a project because it's not going to be you know it's it, I mean even a perfect execution isn't going to be worth the time and investment you put into it. But I think when you have these things defined, clear goals, clear outcomes, it's going to naturally lend itself to, you know, the A players that want to see something like this change your business. And uh, so I, I would say, you know, the team and the, and the, the, the objective are, you know, point one and one A. Yeah. You know, what's really interesting about that is there, there is a flip side that I've run into from time to time. I don't think it's as prevalent, but it's this whole thing. I had a company tell me once that they're, they weren't putting their best people on a, on a cloud HR project because they didn't want to turn them quote into rock stars. 
and and lose them. And and that's the flip, right? Is is this thing around like that you don't want to raise your employees up to become too talented because then they'll have options besides your your company. And and it, it brings up this really important point to me, which is that you know you have to figure out what you're trying to do with your HR software. Are you trying to 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 cultivate exceptional talent, or are you just trying to automate and administrate? And and to me, like you have to really think about whether you're trying to do both or one or the other. And anyway, it's just interesting. So, um, okay. I'm, I'm just going to give you a quick number two of my own. Um, I got, I got my number two, which is like involve independent subject matter experts on your project. And this is something that I mention frequently on this show. So I'm not going to elaborate on it too much, but the point being that I don't care how great your prime consulting vendor is. It needs accountability from somebody else who knows their stuff. And whether that's Bonnie or, you know, it depends on the phase of the project you're in. At some point, you might need a hands-on subject matter expert in a particular software once a product is rolling um, that's that's also independent who can say, hey, you're not configuring this right or whatever. Will it drive your vendor a little bit nuts and your partner? Yeah, it will. But, but, but in a good way, because these products, in my opinion, are too high stakes not to have multiple expert voices who don't have the same uh, financial agendas speaking to you. So anyway, that's my number two. Yep. And you already kind of gave away your number one, but, uh, but let's, let's hear it anyway. Yeah, exactly. So again, it's, it's know your why and start there. So why are you doing this project? What is my clear goal? What is the clear outcome? How are we going to measure success? Um, and so I think, you know, you want, you want, and, and not only that, but you want, everybody on the team consistently focused on that. Like these projects takes can take a year. They can take two years. I mean, God forbid, some of them take five years. I mean, I heard about some that have, you know, we get reviews from, from things that have gone on for multiple years. And I think the, the more consistent you can get those simple goals, your simple objectives, and that why in front of every single member of the team. So everybody's singing out of the same hymn book and sort of aligned in this area. Um, that is what you want um, because that's going to, you know, when you're, you know, way in the weeds of process and you have integration issues or, you know, user acceptance issues, things like that, you need to always have that sort of North star pointing to, you know, what is the impact we're making for the company and how we're going to get through some of these challenges to make sure to, that we get to the other side and, you know, and, and cause the impacts to the business. Excellent. Excellent. And my number one uh, is uh, I've already kind of mentioned it, so I won't dwell on it either, but don't grandfather your vendor of choice in for your new project, just because that's the vendor you work with. Do a fresh evaluation based on your current requirements and and open it up. I don't care if they haven't jumped through the hoops and done the paperwork and they're not a prime or they're not approved. I could care less. That's just a really dumb reason to stick with your current vendor. No more golf course relationships. Sorry. You you know, it's just not, not okay. Um, oh, and Thomas likes um, that I was doing some business development for, for him because he's, he's also an independent. So a- absolutely. I mean, look, I mean, uh, a lot of the people that I respect most in this industry are independents um, because they speak, they speak truth in front of customers. And I think that makes a huge difference. And um, so, yeah, I, I do, I do support it. I have somewhat of a vested interest in that. And, and I think the, the independents are the ones who have deep specialty and functional expertise that, um, you know, particularly with, you know, with, with products um, and, and things like that, that you can get. And, you know, many times are a better value than what you would pay with a, you know, well-known consulting brand. Not, not that, that there's not a play for them too. Um, but not always, I mean, a lot of times there are, you know, there's a lot of more appropriate options for the type of project that you're embarking on that you don't have to, you know, bring in, um, you know, the, the big five, so to speak, there's so many good independent firms out there. You just need to make sure that you're vetting them um, and, and you know, you know who they are and the type of work that they've done. But I mean, quite honestly, that's why you can go to Raven Intel and we can tell you. 
Absolutely. And if you missed that part about how they gather information, we covered that. So you can catch that in the beginning of the, the show discussion. Um, but in, in my view, we need a lot more uh, like upstart analyst firms and data gatherers who have different business models like Raven. So that's why she's on the show today. Um, and, and yeah, I mean, I, I think that I, I'm not in the business of necessarily trashing large consultancies. Some of the smartest people that I know in this industry work for large consultancies, but I think you raised a really important point earlier, which is just be really careful. If you work with larger firms, you don't wind up with a bait and switch where suddenly consultants get switched out. Right. Cause the thing is if someone hires Raven Intel, they're not going to wake up one day and see some fresh face. They don't know because you are Raven Intel. And, and if you send someone else, it's going to be someone that works with you all the times so they'll already know that person. Yeah. So it's different with a larger firm. They can do all this swapping out and it's like, well, no, like I want the person that I talk through all my requirements with. I want that person here. So anyway. Yeah. So team. Well, we are on big. Oh, sorry. Girl. You, you go ahead, Bonnie. Uh, yeah. Team consistency. That's, that's big. It's one of the things that we look at at every single project. The question we ask, was it the same team that you had to begin with? Did it change a little? Did it change a lot? Those are important sort of indicators as to what you're going to get if you sign up with that company. Neil wants to know if you consider talent management part of HCM. Yes, absolutely. One of the really interesting questions we didn't get into today uh, is, is to what extent are customers choosing HCM suites per se, right? Versus individual best of breed components. Um, obviously like, you know, there are vendors who are much stronger in talent management than they are in payroll, for example, that's usually one of the big delineations I see in the market, the administrative HR versus the talent vendors, but some vendors are definitely trying to capture the whole scope. So I don't know if you, you have any final thoughts on how customers seem to be approaching that, but that's kind of an interesting one. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think um, best of breed, depending on on what it is and, and who it is, um, you know, that it, it fits well. Sometimes it offers way deeper um, functionality than you could get with a, a you know, the, the all-in-one suites. Um, I would just go back though to my point about integrations. You want to make sure if you're going with the best of breed that you're you're really thinking through the integration factor and the user experience. Is it going to be, you know, different? You know, um, is, yeah, lots of aspects of getting those systems hooked together that you need to consider as opposed to the, you know, sort of simplicity that you get with an all-in-one solution. You won't probably get as deep in functionality, but you do get the benefit of, you know, one throat, one throat to choke, so to speak. And that's that's why I think that they've become popular. It's not to say that the best of breeds don't have um, a great place. It just, it, it depends on what your needs are. An individual project decision requiring Again, guidance and expertise, uh, indeed. Yeah. Well, folks, we are on the wind down. So if you have any final comments or questions for Bonnie, you need to get on that. Uh, when I wrap the show, I usually uh, do a couple of off-topic type things. Uh, the show is uh, loosely inspired by my weekly Enterprise Hits and Misses column on, on, on Diginomica, which is an opinionated review that comes out every Monday on on uh, the, the state of enterprise software for the past week in the final whiff section, I kind of go off topic and just pick some, some swings and misses from the week. Uh, I have one last week. That's very, uh, very 2021, which is um, a story about a California man who lived inside the O'Hare airport security zone for three months because he was afraid to fly during COVID. So I thought that was a, a real a real keeper story for, for the year. And, you know, it's a fascinating story too. Like, like, so wait, he was afraid to fly, but he felt safe in an, in a terminal for three months, like borrowing food from strangers and stuff like, wow. Yeah. Oh, and, and also it's, it's kind of fascinating too. So he, he has, um, this guy has a master's degree in, in hospitality, I think. So I guess he took full advantage of the hospitality part. But uh, anyway, I thought that was a, a classic story. 
I, um, I read that in no. O'Hare Air, o, O'Hare Airport is my my home airport. I can't even imagine having the food from there for like more than a day. So he's there's something else going on <laughs> with him if he's willing to do that. I'm just kind of sad that he got caught and and unfortunately now he does have to fly because they're not letting him like uh stay there until his his whatever hearing he has. So now he's kind of screwed. So Neil, Neil says, thanks. He, he appreciated you taking the time there on the HCM questions. And then uh, Thomas, yeah, he would have been very safe in your airport. Yeah, absolutely. But, but you guys, you guys live in a more enlightened um, continent than us. Thomas is in Australia. So, so yeah, it's, it's a different story down there, dude. But uh, yeah, he he enjoyed the show as well. So you've got some pretty uh, discriminating individuals who enjoyed your content. So uh, always refreshing to hear your data. Did you have any off-topic uh, whiffs you would like to share with the group, Bonnie? Um, I think you asked me uh, my media pick during the, the pandemic. So oh yeah, yeah, what happening. you got there? Okay, so I have What's I have media two, pick. I have two. Uh, so number one, Queens McGambit. Uh, I. I think that was on. That uh, was on my list too. Yeah. Queen's Gambit is Queen's Gambit is awesome. Yeah, I loved it. I loved it. And I, um, the other one I really liked, just as a like a fun uh, guilty pleasure because I grew up in you know the '80s, is Cobra Kai, and it's a great show. Like my son loved it, and he's 15, and so that's my other recommendation. It's super cheesy, but it's fun and great music. Yeah, that's my other one. Why do I think you were in Australia, Thomas? We got to have a talk about this off offline. Anyway, Seattle, it's kind of like Australia. Uh, so my, my point still stands. It is it is an enlightened pocket, but that, that's really funny. All right, we'll have, to, we'll have to get on that offline. Josh, Josh, yeah, they yeah they should probably put him on a no-fly list. I can think of a lot of people that belong on the no-fly list right now, but let's let's not let's not go there. Um oh we got we got a Cobra Cobra Kai. You know, I haven't watched that yet, but it's on my um it's on my list, so I think you'll like uh, it. Yeah, you'll like it. Yeah, I've I've been um show. rewatching I've been rewatching Mind Hunter, which is one of my favorite my favorite uh, Netflix uh things, but it's not new, so a lot of people have probably already probably already seen it, but uh but I really enjoyed Mind Hunter. I also like um like uh, the the Manhunt series pretty well. If you like, but especially the the season one on the Unabomber is really good, even though. Um, I did some research and it's actually stretches pretty far from the truth in some aspects. You live in New Zealand that, I mean, yeah, that might be, that might be why I was thinking that, but that's still really weird. Um, anyway, Thomas, sorry about that. I don't know how I screwed that up. Um, yeah, it, 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 yeah, it wasn't about chess, right? I mean, chess was, chess was the medium to tell a, tell us, tell a human story, right? Ah, uh, the Netflix picks are flying in. Anola Holmes. I have, Josh, I have not seen that one. I'm going to put it on my list. Thanks. We got, we got some Netflix recommendations. I mean, this show does it all right. I mean, <laughs> it, it's funny too. It's, it's funny too, because I was being really critical of Netflix because I mostly thought their original programming has been pretty crappy, but I think they've gotten a little better lately. And then I read that um, they're showing off a new feature coming soon that will AI is going to pick what you're going to watch. So this is coming soon, evidently. So um, I don't, I don't know exactly how that's going to work, but um, I'm super confident that AI is going to pick the best possible show for me. I'm really looking forward to forward to that. Um, if, if it's just, if it's as good as Spotify picking my music, it's going to be an absolute disaster. <laughs> I don't know what it is. I don't know what it is about AI and entertain entertainment recommendations, but this whole notion, like, because you like this, you will like that is like so deeply flawed. Mm -hmm. It's absolutely amazing. Well, my son shares my Spotify account. And so I get recommendations all the time for this rap. I have no idea what it is. So I looked at like my top listen to 2020 music. I'm like, I've never even heard of these songs. Well, you know, there's a reason for that. and. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It, it's kind of like when Facebook recommends like that you connect with someone where you have 75 mutual friends and it's like uh, Facebook, if we have 75 mutual friends and we're not friends, that should be a clue that we hate each other. You know, 
like like is that pretty obvious like there's something going on or or we have some like sorted or difficult or even heartbreaking history like we got to teach the algorithms something here that anyway we're getting all kinds of off topic stuff now about <laughs> cobra kai we got we got josh on the rapper wap and, and neil is back on radio okay i think we're on diminishing returns but anyhow uh thank, thanks for <laughs> thanks for thanks for joining and uh, i am trying to do this every week around four eastern time i may not always succeed but uh every friday i am trying to do this so and I, i'm going to have some very interesting guests and Bonnie set a great tone for the new year. Thanks a lot for coming, Bonnie, and sharing your data with us. That was great. Thank you so much for having me. And thanks to everybody who listened in and all the great comments and, and questions. It's been really fun. Yeah, that was a blast. All right, later. Bye. Bye.